Welcome all of you. Really glad you're here. I can see many, many folks joining uh, for our discussion on this really important topic with two really fantastic experts um, as we unpack the right-wing plan to undermine Israel's Supreme Court. Okay, uh, I think I'm going to get started as folks continue to join us. So um, we are all here at a really important moment. I think we're all aware, everybody who's joining us today um, in Israel's nearly 75 year history, a uh, really pivotal moment with the furthest right-wing government that Israel has ever had, which has uh, embedded into its coalition plans, a range of extremely consequential actions. Uh, and one of the buckets that is involved is massive judicial overhaul, uh, radical overhaul to Israel's uh, judicial system. And that's what we're really going to unpack here today uh, with two really fantastic experts uh, who I'm indebted to for taking the time to, to join us today. So um, I'm going to keep my comments very short. Um, I know that we've got a lot of ground to cover. We've got a lot of folks who I anticipate are going to want to ask questions. Uh, so I'm going to really plunge right in and introduce our two speakers. So I'll start with Dr. Tamara Hostovsky brandis She is a senior lecturer and associate professor at Ono Academic College's Faculty of Law in Israel, where she teaches and researches in the areas of international and constitutional law, which obviously is perfect for us here today, uh, as well as their intersection with political theory. She earned her bachelor's degree in law from Tel Aviv University uh, and an LLM and a JSD, that's a doctoral degree uh, in law from Columbia Law School uh, in New York. She's also served at a, as a visiting professor at Columbia Law School. Tamar, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for inviting me. Happy to be here. Happy to have you. And then, of course, we have Eran Nissan. Um, he is the CEO of Mechazkim, which is an Israeli NGO engaged in the struggle for a more democratic Israel through digital campaigns. He's also the government relations director at Citizens HQ, which is a strategic partnership of Israeli civil society organizations. Eran served as a combat soldier in the IDF Special Forces which shaped his commitment to promoting a peaceful resolution to the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. He also headed the Education and Advocacy Department at Peace Now, which is where I got to know Iran for the first time. Uh, and as part of the News Story Leadership Program, he interned in the office of one of J Street's heroes, Representative Jamie Raskin, that incredible defender of democracy. And so that really, I'm sure Iran gave you a view of American democracy and of course, Israeli democracy um, that you're fighting so hard for now. So as we get started, uh, I wanna just make one important announcement for all of our audience members, which is that as, you, as you'll all know, if you've joined us before, uh, one of the key aspects of our webinars, all of our JStream webinars, is the opportunity for all of you to ask your questions. So at any point during this webinar, you can go to the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom, and you can put in a question. We will save time at the end of the webinar for, for questions. So please feel free to do that at any time during the course of the webinar. Okay, with that, let's plunge right in. Um, I'm going to ask a lot of questions to Tamar up front to kind of set the scene for us. But before I do that, I'm actually gonna pose a question to both Tamar and Iran to give both of you a chance to answer the same question. How do you see this moment in Israel's politics and its history? Is it, how, how pivotal is it? And what's at stake from your perspective right now? Elan, why don't we actually start with you? Uh, so first of all, uh, good evening here. Good afternoon at your time. Uh, thank you for, for having us and give us, giving us the platform. I feel like this is an, a historic moment. Uh, and we are living through an unprecedented political reality 
where we have, like you said, the most right-wing government. And I think what is very historic and dramatic about it is that we just finished the term of an historic and unprecedented government, which presented uh, right-wing, center, left-wing, Jews and Arabs for the first time forming a coalition, what we refer to as the change government. And right after this, um, you can say successful or unsuccessful experiment, but it was unprecedented. It was the first time in my lifetime that I went and I voted and the people I voted for won or formed the government. Uh, and just after this experience, which was very short, we have this fall of the most extreme right-wing government. And I think for the American analogy or metaphor, it's like after eight years of Obama to have Trump. Like I felt in the past couple of weeks, like this is uh, January of 2017. We were just in power. We were just in the decision makers. Um, the doors were open. They were answering our calls. And now we have this guy who we didn't think that he will be in charge. And he's bringing all this crazy ideas and, and extreme people and is explicitly and outspokenly if, uh, declaring his intentions to make irreversible changes to how our country is being run. And I think that in, as a civil society, as an activist, we have a responsibility because like in many senses, Trump being elected created Me Too, Black Lives Matter. It mobilized the public, it politicized the public, and it also made great changes to the, the discourse. I, I hope that we will see a positive and constructive change also in civil society and the Israeli public. Thank you, Iran. Tamar, same question for you. So I'm going to use the same word. I'm going to say I think this is an unprecedented crisis. Um, and, you know, in the history of Israel, which is a crisis by crisis history, we're always in an eternal state of crisis. Uh, it might sound like an overstatement, but I think that this is actually the case. I think this is an unprecedented constitutional and political crisis uh, that we've never seen before. Um, I think that what's at stake here really is the ability to constitute democracy. Um, I think we're looking at process at a process of that of of, pop, of constitutional populism that is similar to what we see in countries like Hungary, in countries like Poland. Only that Israel is not Hungary nor Poland. Its conditions are much more difficult since we have a national conflict here, and the country is very much divided in terms of population. So the begin opening conditions, I think, are are much more dangerous. And I also think that we have we are witnessing a crisis that we've never seen before in terms of the power struggle between the judiciary and between the government and the legislator. So what we're seeing here is really a situation where we don't know how this will end. Like the, the, the government has put all of its political capital into this project that we will talk about in, in a few minutes. And we don't know how the court will react to this project, whether the court will try to over, override the project itself. And, you know, this could lead to an escalation. This may escalate to an extent where we don't know who, who will the people obey, you know, the government or the court. It could go to that. There is the potential of that, of the, gov of, of, of the Knesset passing this, the, passing these changes, passing this um, proposal and the court, you know, determining that it is unconstitutional under one of the doctrines that are available to it. And then if you ask me, well, what will happen next? My answer is, I don't know what will happen next. Wow. Well, thank you for both of you for setting the scene for us. I, I just, just a little like editorial comment here. Um, I, I'm looking at the Q and A um, I mentioned that folks can submit their questions at any time. I have never in all of the J streams that I've moderated started to see questions pour in this <laughs> early in a webinar. I'm not surprised because I expected a very engaged audience. So please folks keep it up. I'm going to have, uh, I'm going <laughs> to have a challenge here when it comes to moderating all these questions. All right. Next thing I want to do tomorrow, uh, I want to stick with you and I, uh, I will ask you to break down for us pretty briefly um, the key aspects of this revolutionary package that's being introduced by the Netanyahu government to change 
the judiciary. I'll let you characterize it and explain it. Thank you. I think the one thing that may be actually misleading is the focus on the judiciary. It's also the word reform, right? We don't use the word, we say it's not a reform, it's a revolution or changes or whatever you want to term. But I think what is even actually more confusing here is the framing of the issue as judicial reform or even judicial changes, because actually this is not about the judiciary at all. This is not about the court at all. This is about the government. So what's at stake here, I, what we see here, what the ch these changes are about, are about removing all checks and all balances for, uh, on government power. So this is about a government that wants to entrench you know, its control, entrench its rule, that wants unlimited power, that wants to pursue policies that are incompatible with existing law, incompatible with human rights commitments, and it wants to remove the barriers and the checks that may prevent it from doing so. And there are four changes that are on the table now that are debated in the committee. So one of them is really, really focuses on the judiciary and are and on um curtailing the ability, ability of the Supreme Court to perform judicial review of legislation. So I can elaborate a little more later on, on how exactly, what are the mechanisms for achieving this end goal? But the end goal here is making sure that while formally the Supreme Court will still be able to perform judicial review of legislation, in reality, that will never happen. The conditions for that would be made impossible for that to happen. The second change that is on the table is severe is limiting or restricting the ability of the Supreme Court to perform judicial review of the executive of the government through limiting, for example, its ability to use reasonableness as a criteria for examining the legality of government action, etc. And here I have to make a comment and sit to, to, for, to pause for a short comment and say that actually. In, under the Israeli system, the judicial, the, the executive and the legislator are very, very close, right? We have a parliamentary system. Basically, the government should be able to pass any law that it wants in the Knesset, which means that in the Israeli system, it is not rare for the government to promote policies through legislation. So we're saying this is judicial review of the legislator, but actually often what's at stake are government policies that are executed through the tool of legislation that is available to the government. So what we're talking here is about judicial review basically of the executive, whether acting in itself or you know, in acting through its control of the legislator. And the two other changes that are on the table are changes in the um, procedure for the election of judges, nomination of judges, promotion of judges. Um, so that the, the entire process will be political. Today, the judges are nominated through a committee, um, which has kind of a balance between politicians and judges themselves and, and, and judges and members of the bar. The changes, there are various versions of the changes. All of them are geared towards one goal, which is ensuring that coalition has control over nomination of judges through one form of another. And the fourth um, change that is on the table regards the um, status and um, nomination of legal advisors within the government. Um, the question whether their opinion is binding upon government officials or whether it's advisory only, and whether they are they will continue to be public employees are they are as they are now or whether they will be political nominations and they can be nominated and fired once you know government government changes. Now, I think the confusing thing is that everyone in Israel has now become comparative constitutional experts. So if you look at each of these changes differently, you know, then the argument might as well, this is how they do it in the US and the US is a democracy. And you know, the UK doesn't have a constitution and the UK, a written constitution and the UK is a democracy and New Zealand, you know, New Zealand is very central to the Israeli con comparative constitutional debate now because Israel is so much like New Zealand that, you know, that's the relevant point of reference, but you know, this is how they do things in New Zealand. So why isn't it legitimate for us to do it in Israel? But if you take all of these things apart, you know, and you look at the, entire, the whole picture, then what you see is that this is basically an overhaul that picks from every system the features that ensure that there will be least checks on government power, 
and chooses to implement them in the context of Israel. So you take only the parts that are political or the parts where, you know, there is no review of government action. And you say, well, we take this from that democracy and that from, you know, the second democracy and a third facet from a third democracy, we'll implement it in the, in the Israeli system. And I think the question is not just what's in the proposed, you know, changes, but what's not there. I think the question, the kind of kind of guiding star that needs we need to continue to look at and seek for and ask is, okay, if these things go through, if these changes go through, what limits will they there be on government power? What how can we ensure human rights? What will protect individuals? from abuses by the government? This is the only relevant question. And the focus on the court, rather than on the government and on human rights issues, I think is very confusing in this respect because we go into this discussion of you know legitimate judicial mechanisms and systems. But actually there's one question that's that we should be worried about. What will prevent the government from violating human rights if these things go through? And the answer is nothing. Well, that was extremely helpful, if distressing. Scary. <laughs> Indeed. Um, so Tamar, I want to give you an opportunity to respond to the argument or key arguments that are made by the Netanyahu government and backers of reform uh, for those in our audience, if you want to read these for yourself, turn to the Wall Street Journal, which is extensively publishing uh, these, these arguments. Uh, but just you know, to summarize, one of the key ones uh, is the argument that Israel's judiciary features the most activist Supreme Court in the world, and uh, the argument that the court's dominance, I'm quoting here from an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal, the court's quote, dominance over the Knesset is unrivaled by any other parliamentary or presidential system. So the argument, therefore, is that these reforms uh, are necessary as a common sense corrective. So how do you respond to that? Well, first, I reject these comments, but I think there are two parts to the answer. First, I think that the court is not extensively activist. I actually, my personal opinion that the court should be more activist in protecting human rights in many areas. So the court has provided, you know, the state, I mean, a lot of leeway, for example, in the occupied territories, has not performed any serious judicial review over the entire political project of the settlements, except for in the very specific cases of settlements that were established on private Palestinian land. Um, and basically, every, every, almost everything um, that is justified by the court as by the state as necessary for national security reasons, and the court tends to accept the state's position. And we're talking about invalidation of legislation. The court has invalidated a total of 22 laws, you know, since or even uh, specific provisions in laws since 1995. So we're not talking about, and some of them are repeat. Uh, the recurring cases with the same same versions of the same laws. So we're not talking about a lot of issues, a lot of laws that were invalid. And I think this is simply a, 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 this is simply not a true argument. But I think there's also another issue, and the and the other issue is that in the Israeli system, the court really is the only check on government power. Right, so the judiciary, I'm sorry, the, the legislator and the executive in Israel are intertwined because this is how the parliamentary system is built. This is a feature, it's not a bug, right? So the government can very easily pass laws and use laws to further policy. So the legislator is not a real check on executive power. Um, the power is very, it's a very centralized system. We don't have a federal system. We don't have a regional system. Almost all of the power is vested in the central executive in the government. We're not part of a regional human rights court or a regional human rights body like in Europe. So basically when we look at the Israeli system as a whole, not just on the, on the court itself, and we say, well, what other checks on government power do we have? What other ways do we have to ensure that human rights are not violated? The answer is the only institution that performs that role is the court. 
And still the court awards the state a lot of leeway in its actions. I think that also needs to be taken into consideration. So it's a court, you can't just compare courts. You also have to ask what other additional institution, what additional safeguards of rights do you have in addition to the court? And in Israel, we don't have these additional safeguards. Thanks, Tamar. And you know, one thing that I'd like to do is just uh, to mention that you actually published a law review article a couple of years ago uh, that I found very interesting myself. It's entitled The Diminishing Status of International Law in the Decisions of the Israeli Supreme Court Concerning the Occupied Territories, which goes into great detail uh, about some of what you just talked about in terms of, you know, this court not being activist enough and not prioritizing international law enough. So for those in our audience uh, who enjoy reading law review articles, I'm sure there are at least a few of you uh, <laughs> in your in your leisure and spare time, you may want to have a look at that award-winning, excellent article uh, by Tamar. I want to shift gears a little bit uh, and, and turn to you, Iran. Um, this judicial reform package that Tamar has put on the table for us, described for us, and analyzed for us, you know better than most uh, that this was not produced in a flash by this new government as soon as it came to power. It instead came ready-made and produced by a group called the Kohelet Policy Forum. You have dug in very deep regarding Kohelet. And so I would love for you to tell us about Kohelet uh, and its role. And also if you could tell us a little bit about, you know, beyond this judicial revolution, what other laws and policies that the Netanyahu government is gonna put forward have Kohelet's fingerprints on them? Okay, so I'll try to be brief because there's a lot to unpack when we talk about Kohelet. But I will say that the Kohelet Policy Forum is the most influential organization in Israel today, and specifically in the past decade, the brain, both the brain and the engine of all the big initiatives that came out of the right wing area. Now, they will claim that they are um, a think tank like the American version of think tanks that you know, but it's much bigger than that. So the analogy that people use is that there is a giant uh, tractor that is putting its, uh, uh, is going to ruin the Supreme Court. And what Kohelet are doing, they're not just like an American think tank that they will say, okay, this and this is supposed to happen and we'll draft the policy paper and maybe we'll draft the legislation. Because of its resources and its strategic um, outlook, they will fund the public campaign. They will provide the, the op-eds, the talking points. They will create the entire uh, envelope around this piece of legislation or this campaign in order to realize their vision. And their vision is straight out of the Tea Party. So you take the fringes of the Republican Party their economic and also ultra-conservative views, anti-women, anti-gay, um, uh, very neoliberal. So they want to dismantle any uh, public or welfare systems. So privatizing education and healthcare and welfare and attacking unions and, um, and workers' rights. And the Kohelet Policy Forum was founded in 2012 by someone called Moshe Koppel, and his big idea and his life dream was to create a constitution for Israel that will enshrine its Jewish values above its democratic values. And you see that the most uh, important piece of legislation or project that Kohelet have been pushing forward was the nation law bill that we heard that the very, very controversial, I uh, will take you back like three or four years ago, there was a giant debate about uh, this piece of legislation, which is a basic law, which is a cons the, the, the closest to a constitutional piece of legislation that we have, that says that um, 
the Jewish citizens of the country have uh, privileges and rights that are above the non-Jews. And it created a discussion and the people who drafted and campaigned and pushed it for almost a decade were the Kohelet Policy Forum. So for me, as a left-wing liberal activist that have, holds a progressive point of view, whenever there's a bad a piece of legislation or a suggestion that comes from the fringes of the right wing or even the Likud, I look at, I develop this hobby or obsession of looking about the connections with the Kohelet Policy Forum. And more often than, than, than not, I find the fingerprints of Kohelet on this uh, initiatives. So we have the nation state law, like I mentioned, and the uh, Tamal spoke about decriminalizing illegal outposts uh, that are specifically built on privately owned Palestinian land. They pushed this legislation, again, a very controversial legislation. They, uh, they passed a legislation that is, um, goal is to persecute civil society organizations that are funded by governments. So limiting the ability of the left-wing liberal democratic organizations to fundraise and operate freely inside of Israel. They passed a law that conditioned any um, withdrawal from territories under Israeli sovereignty with uh, uh, doing a referendum. And at the beginning of the, of the COVID pandemic, Kohelet were very instrumental in pushing, let's lower the minimum wage, let's uh, stop uh, social security, let's dismantle the, the doctrine, it's called the shock doctrine, the, let's use uh, this very uh, dramatic times to create dramatic changes. Uh, and the Kohelet Policy, Policy Forum, uh, they run like a small college. So they have about 160 researchers. Their annual budget is about $10 million, $10 million which in Israeli like proportion is, is unprecedented. We don't have organizations that are that heavily funded on the democratic, the liberal democratic side of the political map. And Elan, let me interrupt you on sure. that very point, if I may, sure. uh, because this is something that, you know, for us here at J Street as an American organization, something that really caught our eyes and seemed very significant regarding Kohelet, this obviously incredibly effective and influential organization that you're describing, uh, is its funding, is its, is its key funding sources. So if, could you tell us a little bit about that? So about three years ago, there was a big Haaretz expose, and I implore that everyone will read it because you as American citizens should know what is happening, that the people that are behind this, like the reason we are here tonight is to speak about this, this revolution. And this revolution is spearheaded by Kohelet Policy Forum. They wrote the legislation when Yariv Levin, the Minister of Justice, he did the big uh, reveal of this, uh, this platform. He started this press conference by thanking Dr. Aviad Bakshi from the Kohelet Policy Forum for helping to draft all of this thing, to compile all of these um, um, changes, proposed changes. Uh, the donors of the Kohelet Policy Forum are two American billionaires by the name of Jeff Rias and Arthur Danchik. And maybe you heard about Jeff Rias because he's a very private person, tries to stay out of the limelight, but he was dragged into the limelight after the January 6th insurrection. That when the... the Journalists started looking into uh, politicians, representatives that were uh, election deniers and that defended the, the, the insurrections and tried to keep Trump in power. They saw this name, Jeffrey Yass, keep coming back as a big donor. And actually, he was, I think, the sixth biggest donor to the GOP in 2020, the, ninth, the ninth biggest donor uh, like uh, nationwide. And in the recent uh, election cycle in 2022, it was the fourth biggest donor to the Republican Party, funding ultra conservative candidates, MAGA candidates, and pushing forward this platform. Now, 
these are like the friends of the Koch brothers. These are people that don't believe there's a climate crisis, that don't believe there's inequality, that think that any form of government intervention or regulation is a crime. And because the United States is so hard to change, Israel is uh, uh, like a pet project. And about 10 years ago, the, 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 there's this connection between Moshe Koppel and Jeffrey Yass and Arthur Danchik, and they conditioned, allegedly, reportedly, they conditioned their donation, their funding of this project of Kohelet by staying anonymous. And even though their names were exposed and the money trail and the paper trail was exposed, even to this day, when the people in Kohelet are, are being asked about their funders, they're trying to stay vague and trying to uh, uh, keep their uh, donors anonymous. And I think that this is a very big um, weak spot or an opportunity for us as the people who think that this is a disaster. And I implore you as American citizens uh, to understand that the dramatic changes and the threats that are happening right now at our collective homeland are being funded and driven by Jeffrey Asanartu Danchik. And we need to expose this connection and we need to delegitimize this uh, this unholy alliance between conservatives in the United States and in Israel. And we need to um, present a progressive or a democratic, a liberal democratic alliance of, of our kind. And we need to strengthen the tie of the people who are pro-Israel, pro-peace and pro-democracy. And there are things that you can do that we cannot. Like we take to the streets, we run the campaigns, we fight in the Knesset, in the, in the media, on the hearts and minds of Israeli people. We're trying to keep this uh, political energy and trying to minimize or block or to build the, uh, the opposition and the political and ideological alternative. But there are things that you can do in the United States. And it's about writing op-eds and it's about calling your congressman or congresswoman and, and asking and demanding that they will expose this. Uh, and I think that the Kohelet Police Forum is, like you said, very effective. It is very, very dangerous for the prospects of ending the Israeli occupation and the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. It's, it's the biggest threat on the future of Israel as a Jewish and democratic state that is a welfare state, that is a strong democracy, that is the, the, a, a home for the Jewish people worldwide. Thanks, Iran. Um, and I completely agree with you uh, that this is extremely important. The Kohela Policy Forum, the US connection, a very direct connection in terms of funding by two billionaires who, by the way, are based blocks away from where I grew up. They're based in Bala Kinwood, which just like blows my mind. If anyone knows the main line outside of Philadelphia, um, just one little detail that affects me personally. Um, and so, in fact, I wrote a, a recent piece uh, We under the heading, we call it Shushan Street here, that digs in precisely to the judicial overhaul, the role of Kohelet, the role of these American billionaires. Uh, who are funding it. And uh, and I think my colleague is going to put that into the chat in just a second. Uh, and so I definitely encourage folks, if they haven't yet, to, to give that a look. One more question for you, Elan, from me, before we turn to the robust menu of questions that folks have submitted in the Q&A, which is awesome. Elan, you uh, spoke a little bit about what we in the U.S. can do. Talk to us about what folks in Israel, including the two of you, are doing, um, in particular, the protest movement, but anything you want to flag beyond that as well? So with the, the threats, the unveiling of this, uh, this uh, propositions by the new government, it came as this, it was like two weeks that every couple of hours, every day, you have this new crazy declaration. That is not only about judicial and legislation, but also um, homophobic, anti-women, ultra-racist um, Avi Maoz from the extreme right-wing Noam party that got uh, from his coalition negotiations with Netanyahu uh, one of the, the most central positions in the Ministry of Education. And one of the things that he said that he will take out the uh, tolerance-inclusive 
um, progressive pro LGBTQ and women's rights uh, education programs outside of schools, uh, jeopardizing uh, a, a decades long struggle for, of the, the liberal democratic organization to promote and change the discourse regarding LGBTQ plus and women's rights. Um, and every day we had more people angry. And it culminated in this series of protests that we are now on week five. Every Saturday night, tens of thousands of Israelis takes to the street. It started very naturally in Tel Aviv, but now it's much bigger than that. We have dozens of places uh, around the country. I can speak about my parents that are not very political people that they say, we can't stay home. We're gonna grab our friends. They're like, they're retired. And they say, we, we need to be there. There's this, this sense of urgency that we need to be there. And this is winter in Israel. We have about five days of rain a year. And one of these days were the Saturday night, there was a big protest and it started pouring rain and people were standing and shouting and singing uh, and, and marching in the streets uh, to say, we have no privilege to stay home. Uh, and we have seen sectors in the Israeli society that are usually not political, they're apolitical or they're starting to, they, they say we, we're gonna refrain from taking a political stand, mainly the high tech sector, but not only. We saw high school students and university students and universities lecturers and uh, doctors and lawyers and, and all the, the, the usual suspect, the, the anti-occupation pro-peace and human rights organization, the equality organization. And we are seeing the forming of a political movement. And the essence of it, it has tension between the people who are like very center in their political views. They're Jewish, they're very like Zionist, patriotic, and they're saying we need to fight for our democracy. And we need to fight against Netanyahu and the ultra right radicals. But there's also this grain of people saying, we don't just want to block bad things from happening. We don't want to take the wheel back. We want to build something that is better, not just being the opposition, but being the actual alternative. And, and for me, for my organization, that our expertise is social media, we're trying to push forward this narrative of we need to build a center left Jewish Arab political camp. And we've seen it's, it's random, it's not structured yet, but there is this conversation that is going. And one of the symbols of it is that you see that in a lot of these places where you have the protest, you see Palestinian flags. You see people that are going and standing and saying, we can't talk about democracy without talking about democracy for everyone. And these things are tied, they're intertwined. And the biggest threat to Israel democracy is not just Itamar Ben-Gvir pushing forward the National Guard or privatizing the Israeli police. This is about annexation. This is about jeopardizing the prospects of peace. And there's a tension and there's a, a, an uncomfortable conversation between people who say, this is not the time to speak about the occupation and the people who are saying, no, the, 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 the entire crisis is a symptom of a bigger problem. So we are taking to the streets. We have very long weekends. Like uh, today is Wednesday. I have Friday at noon. We have in Tel Aviv the, the parents. It's called the trolleys protest. It's only parents with small children. They're protesting because they don't want their children grow up in a dictatorship. And then on Saturday, we have the marches and then the big protest. And then on Sunday, there is a big women's march and a women's uh, uh, protest a demonstration because they say one of the things that this government is pushing forward is removing any protections on women. And we see from the United States, we need to, I don't need to remind you, but the, the, the fact that they revoke uh, uh, Roe versus Wade after Trump left office, it was because conservative judges were conformed and appointed in his term. And we see the same thing that we fear for the prospect, not this government, but the damage that will happen a decade from now if we'll have a Supreme Court filled with ultra conservative judges about women's rights, about LGBTQ rights, about minorities' rights. It's human rights. So 
right now there is this mass mobilization of uh, Israeli citizens. And what we're trying to do is to create the political vessels because we've been through this mass protest before three years ago. The, the fact that the, the, the we, it was called the Balfour demonstrations because Balfour Street is where the, the official residence of, of Netanyahu. And it was a very spontaneous and, and uplifting. It was before COVID and, and through COVID and it helped. It was instrumental in, in, in making the government fall. But once we had a new government, all the political energy was disappeared. And what we're trying to do now is to create the movements, the political vessels to catch the political energy so we can build this alternative. Thank you for that, Ilan. Um, I'm now going to do my best, wish me luck, to try to uh, put together as many questions as possible, uh, all of the great questions that we've got in the Q&A and pose them to our guests. Um, Tamar, I want to start with you. We have some legal questions that require your expertise. Uh, I'm going to combine some of them here together. Uh, we have Larry Grossman, who is asking, how does Israel, Israel's judiciary function without a constitution? We have a uh, related question to that, um, questions about this, both from Larry and Harry Levy about whether this crisis might be a moment in which we actually see movement toward the establishment of a constitution, which Israel doesn't currently have. If I could add on to that uh, for you, Tamar, so we can try to combine some things here. We have a couple of folks, Robert Ozer and Sharon Hoke, who are both asking varieties of the same question, which is basically, if the Netanyahu government does pass, through, push through Knesset, um, these these revolutionary changes, is there anything the Supreme Court can do about that? Can they strike these things down? Thank you. Wow, a lot of questions. I'll try to, I'll do my a best. A lot of questions. I first do want to take a second to respond to your previous question. Iran talked a lot about the demonstrations in the last five weeks, but actually our organizations, which is the Law Professors Forum, we've been working for three months. Um, so we've identified actually a lot earlier than I think uh, most people what exactly is going on, because we have to understand that all of these changes are a means to an end. So Iran spoke about, you know, it's true that people were very upset when Avi Maoz was appointed because they saw, you know, an extremist in, a, in an educational role, but they don't really understand what judicial reform means or, you know, override clause means. These are things that are in the background. And we are in a, a group of over 100 law professors that we understood um, three months ago where this is headed and what these things are. And we started organizing. In addition to you know demonstrations, we've been holding um, house talks all over the country voluntarily. We've had over 100 of house talks all over Israel. We have a group of volunteers. We go whenever, wherever we're invited, you know, workplaces, people, houses, whatever. We literally don't sleep. We've been writing position papers, submitting them to the constitution. Uh, committee, we've been have we've been sending representatives representatives to each of the discussions, basically to also say that the discussions are illegitimate in itself. So we've been doing things in addition to um, the you know public demonstration. Now I think the question I want to just I want to just break in to say for half a second before I go back to you tomorrow that we are all I think I mean I I think I speak for everybody who's in our audience right now in awe of the amazing work that both of you and so many other Israelis are doing at this I moment. think a lot of people are working voluntarily in, in a way that I, I've never seen before um I mean really I, I'm, I'm going to get law professors to give three or four talks a week and you know at night you know really drive all over the country and I think because people fear the danger I think because the danger is very real and very concrete and I think there are two, 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 two parts of my answer uh, to your question. First, I want to start with the, the question about the Constitution, which I think is important. Um, I think we may come out of this with certain arrangement. My personal opinion, and this is just me, I think Israel cannot have a, a real Constitution, a full Constitution, until the Israeli-Palestinian um, conflict is resolved. Um, because we don't know who the body politic is and we don't know where the constitution will apply. <laughs> you know, a country with no borders. I mean, will the constitution apply in the settlements? Are they part of Israel? Are they not part of Israel? Um, you know, who is the body politic? I mean, if it will apply beyond the green line, then, you know, you have, you have constituents who are not who are not citizens. 
So I think that these two questions are often debated in Israeli public debate as two separate questions, the question of the conflict and the question of, you know, Israel's ongoing temporary constitutional structure with the basic under the basic laws. But actually, they are very much tied because it's very hard to enact a constitution where you don't know who's the body politic and where the constitution, you know, in terms of territory, where the constitution will apply. So I'm not very optimistic about that. And there's a lot of people, but we could come out with something that is more than what we have now. We could come out with constitutional arrangements that are more robust than what we have now with more robust arrangements regarding, you know, relationship between the different branches of government. I'm not very optimistic about it. What Israel doesn't have, and, you know, it's very much noted, is a real Bill of Rights. We have basic law, human dignity, and liberty. It doesn't explicitly state the word equality. The court has included equality through interpretation of the term dignity, as we've just seen as the court in the, in the United States, just as the court can interpret a protection into a constitutional term such as privacy, it can lay a, a different court can interpret, you know, the same constitutional provision in a different way and say, actually, we changed our mind and we think it was wrong to determine that equality is included in the term dignity. England, Israel has today, to date, uh, refused to explicitly recognize equality as a constitutional right in Israel. It does not exist in basic law, in human and in, in, in basic law, human dignity and liberty. And this is something that needs to be, you know, acknowledged. Um, there's a reason for that. It's not just, you know, something that we didn't notice. Now, how can the court address the situation? There are two doctrines which the court has put on the table, but not used in the past, but said it might use in the future for declaring a basic law unconstitutional. Because if all these changes go through, they will go through as basic laws. So the Knesset will enact basic laws that will implement and entrench these changes. And the court has mentioned in past cases, in particular, in the Hassan decision about which regarded basic law Israel as the nation state of the Jewish uh, people, that in some situations, there are doctrines that are available to it to examine the constitu constitutionality of a basic law. One of these doctrines is a doctrine that is called as the unconstitutional constitutional amendment doctrine. It exists in other countries, basically allows the court to declare that a constitutional change is unconstitutional in itself and to declare it void. The second doctrine that is available to the court is the doctrine that it developed, which is called abuse of, const abuse of basic laws. As I said, the process for enacting basic laws in Israel is completely identical to the process of, of legislating regular legislation, which basically means that the Knesset can enact a, a law that should be, in terms of content, a regular law, but call it a basic law or a misuse or abuse it. And then the court has the, the, the ability um, or stated that it might, in extreme situation, determines that a certain use or a certain basic law is abuse of the process of enactment of constitutional norms. So each of these doctrines, which the court has you know, laid on the table but not used yet in the past, are, avail are theoretically available to the court to determine that this move, all of it or part of it is unconstitutional and this void. This is though a very dangerous situation because even if the court does this, we don't know what will happen next. I haven't seen it yet. I just saw a headline today by saying that Yariv Levin said there will be repercussions for the court if this will happen. So I didn't, even, I didn't have time to go into the article. I'm not sure he said what the repercussions will be. Um, but it's very clear that this is an escalation, right? It's an escalation to pass this and for the court to invalidate this. And then for the government to say there will be repercussion. I don't know what these repercussions are. We won't obey the court. I mean, the court decision. I think there was a very um, dangerous or, or I think important moment with respect to the Delhi decision where we, we waited to see, you know, what the government, what, what will Prime Minister Netanyahu do? You know, what will, what will happen next? Will the government obey, you know, the, the court decision? And we're still at a phase where despite everything, I think the consensus is still that court decisions need to be obeyed. But who knows what happens if this escalates? I mean, this is not, if you ask me, you know, well, maybe something good will come out of it. I'm not sure. You know, it's a very dangerous situation to reach where you don't know 
who officials will obey, who the people will obey. This is not a situation, one to be here. What, what's at stake here is incredibly dangerous, I think. We can't undermine the danger of, of escalation. And it's not, a, I, I don't want to go there. So whether the court has, might have the ability to, you know, to declare this to vote, it might, but I think that's not a place, that, that that's not a solution that we should strive towards. What we should strive toward is to stop this process. That's that's the right thing, to stop, to, to, to pressure, to put the pressure, to stall the proceeding, to go to another route, to discuss, you know, I don't wanna say it's not a compromise, to discuss an alternative um, constitutional framework, not a compromise about whether you can, you know, um, violate rights through an override clause of 65 or, or 70 or, or 70 class of member. That's not interesting. About it, but a real alternative, you know, constitutional framework. Let's talk about a bill of rights, and then we can talk about judicial review. Okay, then that's what we should strive towards, not towards a solution of well, maybe the court can declare this whole thing void, and then we'll see what will happen. That's a very dangerous path, in my opinion. Great, thank you. Um, so what I'd like to do, again, trying to put as many questions together here as possible uh, in light of time and volume of questions. Um, Tamar, I've got a couple of follow-ups for you and then a couple of questions for you, Elan. Um, Follow-up questions for you, Tamar. Um, you talked about the dairy decision already and uh, Douglas Morell had actually asked a question about that. Um, what significance do you ascribe to that ruling? Do you take any comfort from the fact that Netanyahu decided that he was actually going to comply with the ruling? And we have a question from Margaret Levy, who asks the reasonable question. How can the court invalidate a law as constitutional if, if Israel doesn't have a constitution? Those are the follow-ups for you. And then, uh, Elan, uh, I'd like you to answer a couple of questions about the protests. We had one question about the tech sector. How important do you think it is that we see movement there and how consequential that might be? And we have a question from Charlotte McCann about the extent to which Palestinian Arab citizens of Israel are engaging in the protests. So uh, Tamar first, and then we'll go to Elan. So I want to start with the second question. It's true that Israel doesn't have a constitution in the sense that the U.S. has a constitution, but it does have constitutional norms. So the basic laws are constitutional norms, basic law, human dignity and liberty, and basic law, freedom of occupation, who, which were enacted in 1992. Both include a provision, a clause that is called the limitation clause that says that the rights um, that are included in these two basic laws cannot be um, cannot be comp cannot be limited unless it is done in certain conditions by law for a proper purpose that is compatible with the values of Israel as a Jewish and democratic state and proportionate so within in their law there is already reference to a situation in which the Knesset might want to limit the rights protected by the basic laws. And the basic laws itself sets the conditions for such limitation. It says rights are not absolute. The Knesset can limit rights, but it has to do so subject to certain conditions. When the law, when the court invalidates a law on the ground that it violates human rights, the process of examination is saying this is a law that violates, for example, the right of, the, the, that violates uh, individual liberty or that violates uh, human dignity. And it is incompatible with the condition that the Knesset itself has entrenched for limiting rights in basic law, human dignity and liberty. So it's not that the court looks at the right and says, oh, we have no legal source under which we can examine, you know, the legality of the, the constitutionality of this act. The constitution, constitutionality of laws is examined under basic law, human dignity and liberty. And under the limitations clause that is included in basic law, human dignity and liberty and basic law, um, freedom of occupation. What the override clause is about is about allowing, allowing the Knesset to enact a law that violates rights without fulfilling the conditions that are included in the limitation clause. 
So it violates rights and it's either not for a proper, the court, it was determined by the court either to be not for a proper purpose or not compatible with the values of Israel as a Jewish and democratic state or not proportionate. And then the Knesset says, I understand, but I want it anyway. I want to, I want to enact this laws anyway. This is kind of the constitutional framework in which the discussion, in which the debate is taking place. Now, the first question, you have to remind me. I started with the second. About the dairy decision. Oh, dairy about the dairy decision. decision. First, yeah, I think you. that there was, if you're asking me if there was a bit of a sigh of a relief about the fact that it looked as if they're compliant, but I think the dairy decision is not over. I mean, the story is not over. It's not, it's still unfolding. You know, there are still rumors. We're now in the age of rumors. Um, so there are still rumors and talk and implications that maybe they will find some way, some legal changes. We have to wait and see. We're at, we're working in a very hectic atmosphere. Um, they, you know, things are changing on an hourly basis, moving very quickly. Every hour, like Iran said, there's something else that is thrown in the air. It, it's even for us, it's very difficult to follow. You know what is going on, and I think, by the way, it's not confidential. I think it's part of it's part of the shock doctrine, right? To keep throwing things in that it's impossible to follow what is what is going on. Absolutely, Elan, over to you. So first, I want to comment that basic law, freedom of occupation, is it sounds different in Hebrew. Freedom of occupation, it's what we've been doing in the past decades, but it has different, occupation is the other word. Like yes, work. it's not that occupation. Yeah, it's not that <laughs> occupation. But freedom of occupation is also something that is hovering above this conversation. So two questions about the tech sector and about Palestinian citizens of Israel or Arab citizens of Israel joining the protest. The tech sector, it's maybe it's too soon to tell, but we have seen a shift in the discourse uh, in the past two weeks from judicial democ dem democracy regime change to the effect on the economy. And very much like the United States, the conversation about economy and the cost of living and inflation and, and credit rating is something that touches people very deeply about the prospects of their own uh, savings and pension and well-being and welfare. And the tech sector is very uh, prominent and uh, instrumental in leading the, the conversation around it. So yesterday there was a big Twitter storm about this Israeli billionaire who said, I'm leaving the country because I don't want to live here. And he's, I'm taking my taxes, my tax paying money with me, which is a problematic discussion as a whole. But I will say that it's more the conversation about economy and not only the tech sector and about Palestinian citizens of Israel. So unfortunately, we have a, a crisis of trust. And we've seen it in turnout in the recent election and also in, in, in cooperation, political cooperation, political partnership. And right now we don't see uh, Arab citizens mobilized. And, and truth be told, they're saying democracy, really? Like to talk about Israel as a democracy is like an internal Jewish thing. Because if you look at history, there were only six months throughout Israel's 75 years existence that Israel did not impose a military rule on Palestinians. And it was between December of 1966 when the military administration of Arab soon to be citizens of Israel inside the Green Line and June of 1967 where the Six Day War and the occupation of 1967 started. So right now they are not mobilized. There's a lot of apathy and indifference. There's a lot of uh, cynicism uh, and about when you need us to vote and when you need us to march the streets, you call us, but you want to save this democracy for you. And this is part of the narrative and the, the conversation that we're trying to change, that we say, let's talk about a government that works for all of its citizens, no exceptions, and rules that, and laws, and we are fighting not as solidarity, but understanding that democracy is democracy for all. And happily, I, I'm... I'm happy to say that there are movements like Standing Together, Nakifman, Umdim Beyachad, that are working very closely with the protest organization, trying to create this narrative and bring in, and there is this pressure from the pro-peace uh, and anti-occupation and equality and human rights to try to uh, involve more Arab speakers at the protest and to put Arabic in the videos and in the posters and to create even the optics of this 
struggle as a Jewish Arab struggle. And again, our role in Mechaskim, in the Citizen HQ, is to build or delay the infrastructure for a center-left Jewish Arab political camp. Great, thank you so much. Well, we have reached the end of our hour. It went like that. Um, we have a ton of questions left in the Q&A, and I regret that we did not get to them all. I feel like we need to do a part two with these two incredible guests uh, who have inspired so many questions. But I'm going to take the prerogative for just a moment um, as, we, as we close out here uh, to give an answer to the question that Mark Fenton put into the Q&A, which is, what should the Biden administration do? Um, there's a lot that the Biden administration can do. We've seen uh, there have been some, you know, great pieces that have come out lately. Uh, Ishan Tharoor just published a piece uh, today, for example, in the Washington Post that talked about the Blinken visit uh, that lifted up Israeli and Palestinian voices, uh, talking about, you know, the desire to see the Biden administration do more. Um, we know that there is a certain amount that the Biden administration is doing behind the scenes, and that's positive, right? And we certainly are in doing everything that we can as an organization to encourage that. And of course, what we, uh, what we continue to advocate for is for the Biden administration to take a more activist role, to not only engage in times of profound crisis, like what we have just seen, not just with the, uh, this judicial revolution issue, but also um, with the um, with the attacks, uh, the the uh, horrific shooting that happened uh, outside uh, the the synagogue in East Jerusalem uh, with the deadly raid in Janine, et cetera, you know, but to to be much more actively engaged on a regular basis. Um, and a key way, of course, that we do work like that at J Street is not just facing the administration, but also facing Congress, right? Our elected officials within our legislative body that we, you know, that many of us have relationships with. And we use that as a lever, right, to try to push the administration as well uh, when we ask these members of Congress, when we uh, educate them, when we ask them to speak out. And so, of course, encourage all of you to be really actively engaged in our, in our advocacy work. In terms of what we can do uh, as pro-Israel Americans, as Jewish Americans at this pivotal time, uh, you know, in addition to that advocacy work, I encourage all of you to think about maybe writing an op-ed and placing it in, in a local paper that talks about the situation that's happening right now and the imperative of pro-Israel Americans, Jewish American organizations to, to be positively engaged on this issue. Uh, we have our new J Street Policy Center, which I want to promote the work that we're doing here. Uh, we, we have produced a, a dossier, which we are continuously updating on the Netanyahu government. I'm going to ask my colleague to, to put it into the chat. We'll have even more updates that are coming uh, later today at the, uh, the link that she's going to put in the chat. So check back there, share it, with your, with your friends, with your representatives as widely as you can so people can be informed about what's going on. And if you're involved beyond J Street in other Jewish American organizations, push for them to be active as well, because that that's also, you know, it's extremely important and can be very impactful. So just offering a few thoughts there. And with that, I want to just offer my heartfelt thanks to Iran to Tamar, not only for joining us for this hour and five minutes, I apologize for taking a little extra time, but also for the incredible work that both of you have been doing. And that I think I and everyone in our audience, certainly everyone at J Street is incredibly grateful for. Thank you both so much. Thank you for, for, having, us. for having us. My pleasure. And with that, we're done for today, folks. Have a great rest of your day. Take care. Bye.